Hey everybody, welcome to today's lecture. Before we jump in, I just want to say a massive thank you to La Trobe University and all our other sponsors uh, who really helped to put these lectures on and make them happen. Would also encourage you all to check out the La Trobe Aspire Early Entry Program. Definitely worth looking into uh, and learning about how that can help you. Now let's jump into the lecture. Hi everyone, welcome to the Psych 128 Our Notes lecture for July. Today we'll be looking at all things to do with Unit 2, so stuff that you will expect to see this upcoming term and in Term 4. So we'll be looking at both areas of study um, and doing a bit of a summary on that and then also looking at some research method stuff. So my name is Loz and I'll be walking through that with you today. Before we do get started, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which I'm presenting from today. So the Wurundjeri and the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. So as I mentioned today, we're looking at the Unit 2 of Psych. So we'll be kind of approaching, um, again, just a sort of condensed version. There is a lot of information um, that will be kind of coming to you in this lecture, you will be able to download the slides and be able to access um, the recording of the video at other times. So don't stress too much if you don't get everything. You guys may be familiar with how the ATAR Notes lectures have run. You may have you know, attended some earlier this week or even a couple earlier this year as well. Um, essentially ATAR Notes, we have a lot of resources available for you know students in year 11 and 12. Also, you know, some of you may be in year 10. Um, it's essentially a lot of high school, you know, resources for high school students made by past graduates. So there are obviously the lectures. We do have a couple of other resources and these include the study notes, discussion forums, which you may be a little familiar with. Um, you know, you guys are in one, two, but once you start getting into your three, fours, you know, maybe if you're entering year 11 next year or in two years, you know, getting things like the ATAR calculator, that sort of stuff. Um, a lot of that information is available on the ATAR Notes website. So if you ever feel like you are looking for, a, you know, a couple more resources or a little bit more information, particularly from students who have just graduated and who have been in the same position as you guys, feel free to take a look at some of the stuff that we've got on our website. If you do feel like you are interested in a little bit more, um, there are a couple of other resources. So Tutsmart is the tutoring company that's run by ATAR Notes. So it's a tutoring company I tutor at. Um, there are a lot of subjects for year 11s and year 12s. And yeah, so, you know, if you feel like you would like to explore tutoring, by all means, go ahead and take a look. Um, we also have some of the study guides that I was mentioning, you know, those hard copy texts, those include your course notes, your topic tests, um, NEEP past exams as well. And they're all available in one place on Ed Unlimited. So Ed Unlimited is kind of like a little, um, like a bit of a Netflix for the ATAR Notes publication. So you can access, you know, all of the course notes, all of the study guides, all of that sort of stuff for any of your subjects available on there. So again, if you think you might be interested, feel free to take a look. Um, so in terms of our lecture today, this is what we are going to be looking at. So we've split it up into about three blocks and that'll be over the next two hours or so. Um, please, 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 as we go through this, don't be shy, you know, feel free to ask any questions you have in the live chat. Um, this can be, you know, on psych, it can be on any other subjects, you're 11, you're 12, anything like that. As I mentioned, you get a copy of these slides, so don't feel like you have to, you know, note everything down and write everything and it'll disappear. Um, yeah, feel free to go it in your, to get to it in your own time. There is a little bit of content, obviously, in this lecture. Psych is sort of known as, um, you know, a pretty content heavy subject. I will say with the new study designs, obviously this year, Psych is using a new study design. Again, um, considering you guys are in one, two, I'm assuming, you know, most of you might be in year 11, maybe year 10. Um, you may be familiar or unfamiliar with the concept of the study design. So the study design is basically made by VCAR and it just has an outline. It's a very clear outline of everything that you can be assessed on. So in one, two, it's important. In three, four, it gets really, really important to sort of know what's on the study design. Um, I personally did psych in, I did psych one, two in year 10, and then I did three, four in year 11. Um, I got a 50 in psych. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I think it was one of my favorite subjects, I think particularly because of the content. And I think that helped me um, sort of be encouraged to learn about it. I know it might not be the same for everyone. You may not be your favorite, but if you can find something you like about it or 
if you can kind of see it in a way that interests you a little bit, that can sort of motivate you um, to study. Again, in saying that, you might hate it a lot, but um, I think if you put the effort in, psych is a subject where the effort really does translate to your results. Um, I think because it is quite a popular subject and a lot of students take psych, um, three, four in particular in year 12, um, it can be seen as a little bit more challenging to do well, maybe just because of that idea that a lot of people are doing it. But I don't really think that's necessarily the case. I think if you put the effort in, it's definitely something that, like a subject that can be grasped and I suppose like mastered. Um, and I think once, you know, if you get on top of it, then you can definitely score really well. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the idea there. Um, as I was mentioning with Psych 1, 2 in the study design, um, the study design, I would say, has cut a bit out rather than put a lot in. Obviously, there are new dot points, but I think um, with 1, 2, there wasn't too much of a change. They just reshuffled things around. Um, 3, 4, kind of similar as well, but... Um, just be aware that if you use older resources, I know in year 11 as well, or in, sorry, I should say one, two, um, resources might be a little bit harder to come by in terms of practice questions, but just be mindful that it's a new study designed for this year. So certain questions might not be relevant. And if there's new points on the study design, you might not see questions on those topics as much in old resources. Um, so just be mindful of that. I will, we'll talk about exam tips at the end, but in terms of, you know, practice questions and past VCAR exams, try to get, try to build some good habits this year in one, two, so that you can use them in three, four. Um, so a good habit to get into is using the VCAR website and using their past exams. So again, obviously very important in year 12. In one, two, sort of luckily though, um, as the study design changes, a lot of stuff that used to be on the three, four curriculum, like years ago, like in the, even like the early 2000s, late 2000s, um, that stuff is now on your sort of syllabus, if that makes sense. So stuff that used to be um, on the year 12 exam is now what you guys get assessed on. So you can kind of use questions from yeah, like 2005 um, and stuff like that that are available on the VCAR website. So if you're looking for more practice questions, sometimes those can be useful for you. Um, but yeah, otherwise today we're going to be covering behavior and perception. Um, these, I would say they're not, I'd say perception might be one that's a bit trickier to grasp. There's a couple um, sort of terms and definitions and things like that, that you might not have heard of before so that may be why it's a little bit more challenging whereas social cognition the thing is with psych what i found is um everything is very application based and lots of it is sort of relevant to you so with social cognition and behavior i think that might be a little bit easier to grasp because i just relate it to myself all the time and that's what i found helped me with studying as well even in year 12 you learn about things like sleep and about memory so obviously because the stuff is so relevant to you and you have a lot of lived experience, obviously with, you know, sleep and with memory, um, and just like this as well, you've got lived experience with your behavior and social cognition. I think that can make it easier to study because you can think of yourself as an example of what you're learning, if that sort of makes sense. So I encourage you guys to kind of think about it in that way. And that can sort of help you, um, yeah, go to good, get a good grasp on the content. Okay. I think I've covered everything there. Um, but yeah if you've got any questions just chuck them in the chat you can also feel free to email me if we don't get to everything by the end um my email is just lordes at tutesmart.com i'll mention it again at the end um but if there's anything you would rather send by email or yeah if we just don't get to it then feel free to um just shoot an email through all right so starting with behavior there are a couple terms that you need to be aware of and again all of these terms are spelled out on the study design so try to get into the habit of reading it and almost like you don't have to memorize the study design word for word but memorizing at least kind of what dot points are covered i would say is a good tip um so person perception is something you have to figure out and it, it sounds exactly like what its name is it's your perception of people and often we think about the judgments we make on people upon meeting them so this idea of first impressions um and how we perceive other people um, so first impressions, obviously we think about things like your physical appearance, nonverbal communication, you know, the initial conversations that you have with people and the way that 
this first impression sort of forms a foundation of that person as you get to know them. So obviously, you know, first impressions change and things like that, but there is quite a big emphasis in your brain, at least on this first impression. And often your initial impression of someone is really quite influential as to how you perceive them um, in that sort of continued relationship. So that's that idea there. Um, So attribution is an important thing to be thinking about in terms of social cognition. So it's this idea of situational attribution and dispositional attribution. So it's all about how we perceive um, other people and sometimes as well how we perceive ourselves. So situational attribution, again, as the name sounds, in psych, a lot of the stuff is very, um, it's named very aptly. So it's exactly what the name sounds like. So I found that, um, and this goes for in year 12 as well, rather than trying to rote learn, you know, like, thinking about dispositional attribution and what the definition of it is and, you know, what this is and just like kind of attaching the meaning to the name. That is probably not the best idea. I think for me, I found that if you can actually look at the name and think of the name, it's the biggest cue to understanding what it is. So if you think about, you know, what attribution is and what, you know, situational as in a situation versus a disposition, like a person's disposition, a person's sort of Um, character, it basically gives you the definition of what these terms are. So I really implore you guys, as you go through psych and you sort of learn terms, don't just blindly look at the words and not sort of understand what they mean, because oftentimes they're named very accordingly. Um, So that can sort of help you out. So situational attribution is this idea of the individual's actions, rather than being attributed to them, it's attributed to the situation. So Um, let's say if someone is, oh, I don't know, someone is late, maybe something like that, that idea that it's definitely their circumstances that made them late. It's not them. Whereas dispositional attribution is this idea of this person is late because they, you know, there's something like wrong with them, not wrong with them, but like it's due to their behavior as opposed to something going wrong in their environment. So we'll talk about it in a second, but the idea of situational and dispositional attribution is that often with us. Um, particularly with something like, you know, like being late or something that's seen as perceived as maybe a bit more negative, um, we'll be more likely to sort of attribute those circumstances to the situation. So we use situational attribution for ourselves, but with someone else, we use dispositional attribution. So we're more likely to say, um, you know, I failed my test because of like all these other circumstances and blah, 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 like it wasn't really me. Whereas if someone else fails their test, you're going to say, oh, it's because they're, you know, it's because they're dumb, it's because they're silly, like whatever, blah, blah, blah. Um, It's that idea of these kind of biases we have and how when we perceive other people, we perceive them differently to obviously how we perceive ourselves. Um, But we can tend to perceive others in a way that might not be accurate or sort of unjustified even. Um, Okay, so it comes down to this idea of your attitude. So attitudes is important thing to understand when we relate it to behavior because your behavior comes as a consequence of your attitude. So you've got your implicit and your explicit attitudes. Um, so again, it's very much in the name. So your implicit is kind of, you're not really thinking about it consciously, whereas your ex- explicit sorry, attitudes are a little bit more deliberate. Um, so your implicit attitudes, this idea of being involuntarily formed and difficult to self-report, you can't even really comprehend the attitude if that makes sense that's why it's implicit whereas your explicit attitudes you know maybe i hate um i don't know peanut butter or something like that that idea of those explicit attitudes that are very you're very aware of are different to implicit attitudes and implicit attitudes might be you know something perhaps like a little bit more serious than you know my opinions on food or something like that um So with your attitudes, you can see on this diagram on the left, we have our ABCs. And this is a recurring thing that comes up in psych units one through to four. Um, This idea of your affective, your behavioral and your cognitive, these sort of components. Um, In this setting, we look at how it forms an attitude. So affective refers to your sort of emotions, your emotions and your feelings, behavioral, obviously your behavior, cognitive sort of things that you're thinking of and how these form an attitude. So your emotions and your thoughts and sort of your feelings will obviously influence your attitude, your behavior towards certain things. Again, this has that sort of relationship. It almost has a little bit of a um, 
two-way street with your attitude because your attitude influences your behavior behavior influences your attitude as well and then cognitive obviously so like kind of um actual formed opinions and decisions and things like that and how that forms your attitude as well so hopefully that makes sense um so we've got this attitude we've got this sort of perspective in our head and it's this idea of what is required to translate this attitude into a behavior so we look at four things um the first is the strength of the attitude so it's pretty um intuitive this idea that if you've got a really strong attitude you are more likely to express that behavior so if you um have a oh gosh i don't know if you've got like a strong attitude towards um climate change or something like that then you'll be more likely to demonstrate behavior that's linked to that you know you might be more um I don't know, more inclined to join like a club at uni or something like that, or more inclined to, um, I don't know, run a campaign, something along those lines. Whereas if you have a weak attitude, um, so maybe, you know, I don't know, you don't care about it that much, you're probably less likely to be inclined to join a club. It's all those sorts of things. And that can go for like any other club in the world. Um, the social context of your attitude. So this idea of if you were to display this behavior and sort of emulate this attitude, um, what the result would be. So if it's something that's illegal, you're probably less likely to do it. If it's something you might perceive as, you know, it might make you an outcast, you might be less likely to do it. Um, that sort of stuff. It's sort of how appropriate your attitude is in a certain context. Um, number three, we're looking at the accessibility of the attitude. So this might sound a little strange, but it's basically this idea of how um, how easy the thought comes to mind almost. So this idea of how easily your attitude is expressed. So again, if we're going with the climate change thing, this idea of, you know, if someone is discussing it or if the topic comes up, you really instantly always think of this specific attitude that you have on it. Um, again, that sort of links to strength in this idea about how almost passionate you are about something. Um, whereas if we're discussing a topic of, yeah, climate change, and you don't really care, like maybe you're the opinion that like, oh yeah, you think it should be, you know, something should be done about it, um, doesn't really come to mind as quickly. It's this idea of that accessibility. Um, and then the last thing is your perceived control over your behavior. Um, be mindful, this isn't like, you know, like self-control, but it's this idea about um, if the behavior is actually going to be meaningful. Um, so again, if it's this idea on climate change, it's, is me joining a club actually going to be beneficial? You know, is it going to do anything for the cause? That sort of thing. Um, yeah. So it's that idea about, should this attitude become a behavior? Is this behavior actually going to be, is there a reason for me to display this behavior? Basically is the idea. Um, okay. So cognitive dissonance is another thing that we think about when we think about our attitudes and our behavior. And it's basically when there's a mismatch between the two. Um, so it's this idea that you engage in a certain behavior while having the opposite attitude or having an opposite belief. So you might think about like, um, for example, like unhealthy behaviors, like if you, um, were to, you know, be a smoker, but you might be aware of the health implications of smoking. Um, it's that idea of being in a, a kind of cognitive dissonance. So this idea that your brain thinks one thing but your behavior is doing the opposite. That's the idea of that sort of mismatch. Um, and that's sort of this sort of, this, oh my gosh, I can't even speak, this little dilemma that you kind of face and it puts you in this like, you know, like sitting on the fence, like you don't know what to do. And that can lead to, you know, I don't know, discomfort and this sort of thing. So you kind of actively try to reduce cognitive dissonance. So this might mean changing your behavior to match your attitude or vice versa. So this idea with smoking and the health implications, you know, you might quit smoking that idea because you know about the health implications or you might change your attitude in terms of, you know, the health implications aren't that bad or, you know, I enjoy it a lot. So I like don't really care about it or this idea, you know, kind of like pros and cons almost. Um, but it's that idea of weighing up the pros and cons and then thinking, okay, I'm going to lead more towards my attitude or more towards my behavior in an effort to make them match up. So you're not sort of struggling with this. Um, it's almost like the devil and the angel, you know, that little thing when you think about them on your shoulder, um, sort of like that. 
Um, so reducing the importance of the attitude and behavior, again, sort of downplaying it. So this idea, like, um, yeah, the health implications aren't that big. Like, I know I'm aware of them, but it's not that big. Um, or maybe on the opposite side, you know, I only smoke socially or, you know, I don't rely on it that much and that sort of thing. Um, or the last thing, kind of adding new elements to support your behavior or attitude. So, oh, I know it's bad for your health, but like, um, you know, I've read all these things where it can be good for your health or something or that, or like, I don't know, I'm going to die anyway. So, you know, blah, 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 blah. Um, so yeah, these are just some examples about how individuals sort of actively try to not justify their behavior, but when they are aware that they're engaging in behavior that they don't necessarily like agree with um it's this idea of we try to line them up as much as possible because it's an uncomfortable experience to engage in behavior that you yeah don't necessarily i guess support um so hopefully that makes sense with cognitive dissonance okay so we've got some examples of cognitive biases these are really important it's such a big thing in psych it comes up a lot in um year 12 and like even like in uni as well it's something that you come across a lot um so cognitive bias is this idea of basically not thinking not logically but um not thinking objectively almost as a way you could um discuss it so it's this idea of faulty decision making and making errors in your judgment um so everybody suffers from Oh, like suffers everybody has you know cognitive biases um it's not like if you have it you're abnormal like everybody has these um but it's just this idea about how this has such a strong influence on our social cognition and on our behavior because we like to think of things um incorrectly basically so these are just a couple of examples there's like about a billion different types of biases out there um, but these are the common ones you might come across. So actor observer bias and self-serving bias we'll talk about in the next slide. They're kind of what I was talking about with um your situational attribution and your dispositional attribution. Your anchoring bias, we'll just run through these. Your anchoring bias is basically when you um, put more emphasis on sort of like the first piece of information you're given. So if you are being sold something, um, you yeah so if you're being sold something um you might get the first price of this house maybe i don't know um you get the first price of this house and it's really expensive and then you go see another house and it's really cheap um you know you see another house and it's cheaper this idea of you're kind of always comparing it to that first house or to this you know certain house um and the idea is that your perception or yeah, your judgment can be a little bit skewed because you might think, oh my goodness, this second house is so much more, is so much cheaper um, than this first house. You know, it's such a good deal, but it's this idea that maybe they're both really overpriced. You know, maybe this one that you perceive as so much cheaper and a really good deal is actually still expensive and maybe it's more expensive than other things on the market. Um, but it's that idea of anchoring bias, like, like an anchor. One piece of information is kind of the the weight and you're always coming back to this first piece of information um, like doesn't necessarily have to be first but like just this piece of information that's forming this sort of core of your comparison um attentional bias is basically just like attention um it's when you pay attention to certain things and not to others so that might be for a lot of different reasons um but yeah in making decisions and judgments um this can lead to bias because you aren't really considering everything fairly you're just paying attention to certain things and not to others. Um, confirmation bias is this idea of always trying to find information that fits in with preconceived ideas. So if you have this certain um, belief or sort of knowledge, you have a tendency to look for information that agrees with that rather than disagrees with that. Hence the term confirmation bias. You're drawn to things that will um, yeah, support the knowledge that's sitting in your head rather than being open to all sorts of information. Um, hopefully that makes sense. So the halo effect, halo effect is this idea of, um, people that you find attractive kind of being associated with other positive traits. So if you've got two people, you find one attractive, you find one less attractive, you might not know anything about them, 
but the person that you find more attractive you're going to associate with perhaps you know being a nicer a kinder person being more intelligent that sort of thing whereas the person who you find less attractive you'll perceive them as you know they might be less intelligent than the other person or less kind that sort of thing um because you associate one positive trait with someone you think that all of the other traits will be positive as well that's the idea of the halo effect um hindsight bias is this idea of um thinking that things were more obvious than they actually were so like um if you do a test and then you pass it after it, you might be like oh yeah i knew i was going to pass or like oh i knew i was going to do well in this test when in actuality you might have been like about to flunk the test like you might have not done as well um or like if you watch a game or something you might be like oh yeah i knew they were going to win whereas when you were watching it you know maybe you weren't that sure it's this idea of hindsight bias you think that um based on the result of something you tend to think that you are more sort of confident in it or more towards the result than you were um misinformation is to do with basically the fallibility of memory so you can memories are very easily manipulated um and that's this idea of misinformation so if you tell someone it's this idea of a leading question so often with um like the police or something if they have a witness statement they may they might ask someone um you know what um I don't know, color was their gun or something like that, or, you know, how big was their weapon? And that is what you call a leading question because it implies that this criminal had a weapon with them. Um, There may have been no gun. There may have been no weapon. Um, Or even like, how fast was this car going? That idea of, oh, it must be fast. And then the individual who's being asked the question they're more likely to say, oh, you know, yeah, it was a big weapon or, oh yeah, they were going pretty fast. It's this idea of misinformation and how that can change people's perception and memory. Um, Yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Actor observer bias and self-serving bias are kind of in here. So this is what we were discussing earlier when basically we are like in love with ourselves and not other people. So other people, again, if they um, do something wrong, then we often say okay that's due to their innate factors that's due to their personality it's due to their characteristics and the situation doesn't play into it that much we say the same thing when we do well so when i pass a test when i get an award i say oh it's because i'm so smart i'm so intelligent i'm so hard working um and it's not because you know i can afford like um the best resources and stuff like that Um, whereas when we fail something, we'll say, oh, it's because, you know, the resources I used were really bad or I don't know, my teacher was really bad or something like this, um, as opposed to, oh, maybe I didn't work hard enough or maybe I was lazy. Um, that's the idea of self-serving bias. We're always prioritizing ourself. Um, yeah. Whereas in other people, we tend to see particularly their faults as something that's really due to their personality. But for us, it's the other way around. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Please let me know if any of that is confusing. Um, So heuristics is another sort of thing that we use when we make judgments and that can be sort of error prone. Um, So they're basically just these little shortcuts that we always sort of jump to when we want to make decisions. Um, So Vikar want you to know the positives and the negatives of these heuristics. So positives are this idea that, you know, it's great because it leads to efficient decision making. So in a fast paced situation, you can make decisions and it's great and you can use, you know, draw on prior knowledge so it can be relatively informed. However, the negatives are when we use these mental shortcuts, we make generalizations that, you know, sort of one size fits all. And like based on all this information, this must be true in this case. Um, which isn't necessarily true and that can form sort of the basis of stereotypes and prejudice when we start to um yeah basically assign all the previous information or experiences we've had to everything that's kind of similar um so three things we think about with these heuristics are the availability the effect and the representativeness so availability is this idea again sort of thinking about accessibility um, how easy it is to bring something to mind. So how quick these, you know, mental shortcuts are. 
it's this idea of um, when we're making a decision, how easily does this come to mind and therefore we're more likely to act upon it because it's a very almost innate thing. Um, in terms of effect, so this is, again, thinking about emotion. So rule of thumb with psych, when we see affect with an A, um, as opposed to the verb like affecting something where it's to do with emotion. So just always think affect means emotion. So when we thought of like the ABCs of our attitudes, I thought it effective. Um, again, that was to do with emotions. And next year, when you look at ABCs, it's always to do with emotions. So just bear that in mind. Um, but this is the way in which our emotions play into these decisions. So when we have to make decisions in this fast paced um, environment, our emotions definitely play into this and kind of influence what our decision will be. Um, and then the last thing is representativeness. So we talked about how people are drawing on information of past experiences. It's this idea about um, how this situation sort of fits into a box. So with psych and with humans in general, we like to, I guess, compartmentalize things or always um, relate new things to things that we've experienced in the past. We like to put like, I always think, you know, like there's little kids games where you've got like a hole for a square and a hole for a triangle and a hole for a star. And then you have to like put each one in. That's what we like to sort of do with our experiences in our brain. Um, so it's this idea of representativeness. So how this current situation, how this current decision um, sort of relates to ones that we've seen in the past or the typical idea we have of these situations or, you know, these, um, like this person, stuff like that. Okay, so this is really important, being able to understand the difference between an attitude, stereotype, um, prejudice, discrimination. So prejudice is basically the attitude. So we have this sort of um, perspective of someone based on their membership in a particular group. So often we might think about like race and this sort of thing. Um, yeah. Or, you know, there's obviously a lot of other characteristics you can discuss. But um, this idea of prejudice is just this sort of previously formed attitude based on what we think of someone or this whole group generally. And so anybody who is in this group, we apply that attitude to them. So that's regarded as prejudice. Um, stereotyping is quite a similar thing, but it's having particular thoughts about this person. So an attitude is sort of like an opinion. Um, thoughts and beliefs are kind of, oh, this person is from this group, so they must have these sort of traits. They must act in this sort of way. They must look, you know, they should look like this. Um, that's that idea of stereotyping. And then discrimination is basically acting upon our prejudice or these stereotypes um, and expressing that outwardly. So remember we talked about how attitudes can turn into behavior. So it's how prejudice ultimately turns into discrimination. Um, so obviously prejudice and discrimination aren't good things. Um, they're errors of judgment ultimately. And again, it's that idea of trying to fit everything into a box. Um, and then that sort of leads to prejudice. And then when that prejudice is so strong, it leads to discrimination. Um, so again, this can be sort of like discreet and more explicit, um, particularly in sort of intentions behind it, but it's just this idea that you're always trying to eliminate or you should always be trying to eliminate, um, you know, feelings of prejudice and discrimination. So an example of some ways to do this, this idea of intergroup contact um, is this idea of kind of mixing these two groups who are prejudiced against each other. Um, and it's just this idea of having people come into contact with others and sort of seeing things from other perspectives. Um, so subordinate goals, this is idea, the idea that both of these groups have an overarching goal. So they have a goal. This goal can only be achieved by working together. And the idea of being superordinate, this goal trumps all other goals. It's that idea of working towards something in common. Um, and that can sort of lead to, yeah, reduced prejudice. I feel like that's always like the plot of like certain movies and stuff like that. Like when you have two groups that like hate each other. And then if they just share the same goal, then they like work together and stuff. That's that kind of thing. Um, so equality of status, this idea of understanding that you're both in the same position. If there is a power imbalance and one group feels like they're much more superior, that's 
going to defeat sort of the purpose. Um, that's just going to perpetuate that prejudice because it's this idea that the other group is inferior to them um, and we're not on the same playing field. And then lastly, cognitive interventions, which is pretty straightforward, just this idea of, you know, putting yourself in someone else's shoes, um, challenging the stereotypes that they hold, you know, hearing things um, from a lived experience, that sort of thing. I feel like if you understand what prejudice and discrimination is, you can kind of think about how they could be diminished. Um, okay, so kind of moving on to this idea of group social influence. So some terms to be aware of. So a group, I'm, I'm sure you're um, aware of what a group is. In terms of social influence, it's this idea about how um, your thoughts, your feelings and your behaviours um, are ultimately influenced by others around you, your perception of others around you and the beliefs of others around you as well. So it's this idea that I'm acting in this way because I think, you know, this person will perceive me like this, or I think this person thinks this. It's that idea. Um, and social influence is very, very, very powerful in terms of our behavior. So two things that come into this and how influential they can be is this idea of status and power. So status refers to um, how the... People, the rest of the group, basically, how important they think someone is. So, you know, often you think of like this sort of hierarchy. It's this idea, is this person the leader of the group? Are they, you know, really low down? Um, and that will obviously influence how you behave around them, what you think of their opinions and that sort of thing. Um, and then power, this kind of goes hand in hand with status. It's this idea of this individual having um, the ability to influence the rest of the group and to influence them strongly so obviously the more power you have the more influence you have over the rest of the group and then that can tie in with your status so the higher status you have the higher power you have um that sort of thing okay so here's a table describing the types of power um so your coercive power again all of these things here very much in the name so coercive power this idea of being able to coerce someone because you are able to give negative consequences so if we think about um you know like teachers and students maybe or like um i don't know a manager or whatever and a worker that sort of idea um this idea of negative consequences so maybe i don't know docking pay or firing them um you know failing them on an exam or something like that I don't know, contacting parents, this idea of coercive power that can um, basically influence how the other person acts around them because they know that if they were to maybe disobey them or do something wrong, negative consequences will arise. Um, expert power is this idea of being an expert in a field, having um, certain skills, a certain knowledge. So um, again, maybe this idea of like, Teachers, maybe you can kind of think about that idea. It's just being well-versed in a certain topic. Um, informational power is this idea of having information that can only be accessed sort of through them. Um, legitimate power is this idea of... Um, legitimate power is like they have authority, but it's sort of credible because they have this certain position um, so perhaps legitimate power may be like your, um, I don't know, school captain or something like that. Um, this idea of sort of having a position that assigns authority to them. Um, so yeah. So for example, I don't know, like if your school captain is a bully or something like that, um, it's, it might be this idea of legitimate power. Like the year sevens might do what your school captain says because they regard them in this status or in this power of position, in this yeah, power, position of power. Um, referent power is just this idea of wanting to be liked by someone. So, um, yeah, this idea like someone might order you around and then you do it because you want to be seen, you want to be liked by them ultimately, um, or you want to emulate them, you want to act like them. And then lastly, reward power is basically the opposite of coercive power. You can take away negative consequences and give good ones. So again, that's sort of like that teacher um, or like boss sort of thing, like you can give them a pay rise or something. Um, that's the idea. So hopefully those all make sense in terms of how they're different. You just have to be able to understand, 
um, you know, certain examples, I always say psych is all about application. So rarely will you ever get a question that's like, what is coercive power? What is referent power? Instead, you'll get this scenario, you know, like so-and-so is at school, I don't know, the school captain is like ordering these kids around. Um, what type of power are they displaying? And it's that idea, or, you know, like give reference to the scenario and how they are um, using legitimate power or something like that. Um, so it's all about application and that's why practice questions are really important. Okay, so we have a couple of experiments that ultimately showed human behavior and the effects of social influence on human behavior. Um, a lot of them are quite famous experiments. The Stanford Prison experiment is very, very, I don't even know if I should say famous or like notorious really, because it was really unethical. Um, but it did show a lot. So basically we got participants they had you know random jobs they were all different they didn't know each other i believe um and they randomly got assigned some to be prisoners and some to be guards so we had this little mock prison and they they knew that this is what was going on like they knew that some people would be assigned prisoners some would be assigned guards and that it's a mock situation like no one's a real prisoner or a guard um and then basically they just gave them instructions in terms of you know the guards need to like you know, maintain the behavior of the prisoners, whatever. And they put the prisoners obviously in their, in a typical prisoner environment. Um, and basically everyone just slotted into their roles. So the prisoners became very submissive. They became very withdrawn. The guards who had a lot of this power, obviously they became aggressive. They became, um, really quite ruthless. And if we refer to this, they had coercive power. They had, you know, legitimate power, um, reward power as well, that sort of thing. And even though it wasn't like valid, like again, they knew it was an experiment. They knew that no one was a real prisoner or a real guard. Um, but it's just this idea of they were assigned roles and some were given power and some weren't and they just fit right into those roles. Um, and I think it was meant to run over two weeks and it ended after six days or something like that because a lot of the prisoners had like proper psychological harm. Um, so it's very unethical for that reason. And this idea of withdrawal rights, I think, um, they like the guards like properly punished the prisoners and then um yeah I think they weren't able to sort of withdraw like you know they wanted to withdraw and I think only after yeah those six days I guess um they were like okay oh this is getting a bit dodgy let's end the experiment here um so it was a brief sorry a breach because they weren't able to withdraw when they wanted to um and obviously this idea of beneficence so beneficence is always maximizing good um, and preventing harm and always, you know, minimizing harm at all costs. That's also a bit of non-maleficence, but we'll get to that a little bit later on. But um, obviously in this case, beneficence wasn't really kept. Um, the researchers kind of observed the prisoners into these really sort of awful states um, and just observed it. So it wasn't a very ethical um, experiment, but it was very interesting to see just how... Um, I guess, well, everybody fit into their role. So this idea that as soon as these guards were given power, they used it to an insane amount. And the idea that these prisoners kind of, I guess, obeyed them or, you know, were influenced by that as well. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, I'm sure your teachers will go over this experiment, but if they don't, um, definitely take a look at it. It's quite interesting. Um, okay, so another sort of famous one is Milgram's obedience experiment. So the experiment with this, again, quite unethical as well, um, is that people were put in an electric chair um, and the participant was given a remote and basically told to electrocute them. Um, so the idea is that there was someone in the room and they told them, you know, electric, I think it was like if they got a question wrong, I don't know, something like that. But anyway, However it happened, the um, the sort of experimenter or the person in the room told them, okay, electrocute this person at like, I don't know, maybe like 10 volts or something. And then every time they would get it wrong, a little bit higher and then a little bit higher and a little bit higher. Um, so the results of this were that, you know, 300 volts, like we're not talking about, you know, a little amount of electricity here. Um, all of the participants, all of them went up to 300 volts. So you know, obviously they were instructed to shock these people and they all obeyed them. Um, 65%. So again, 
the majority went um, all the way to 450 as well. So obviously some people, you know, said no by then, but the majority of them said yes. And it's this idea of obedience um, and how they were all influenced to obey this individual, even when they knew what they were doing was probably not correct. You know, they wouldn't have done that anyway. If you went to someone in the street and told them, you know, give this person a shock of 450 volts because they got a question wrong, you'd say, oh, no way, I would never do that. But in this sort of environment, um, it was done. And so this idea, the ideas or the influences that we look at are social proximity, legitimacy of authority and group pressure. Um, so social proximity, this idea of how close the person instructing you to do something is, and also how close perhaps in this situation, the other person was to them. Um, but it's this idea of how, yeah, close the person instructing you is. So in this experiment, the individual was in the room um, when they would tell them to electrocute them. Or, you know, if we think about it in a real life setting, maybe it's this idea of how close you are to a certain teacher, um, you know, your relationship with the person who's instructing you to do something that can sort of influence how obedient you are to them or how likely you are to obey their instructions. Um, legitimacy of authority. So the people knew they were entering an experiment and the idea that this person was telling them, you know, electrocute this person. It's this idea that they're, you know, they're running the experiment. They're obviously, you know, a professional in this field and like, I'm just a little participant, like I don't really know. So then they were more inclined to obviously say yes. If it was like a little boy on the street who came in and was like, oh, you know, shock this person, shock this person. That's obviously not, they wouldn't, they'd be less inclined to do that. But the idea that this person seemed to be, you know, quite legitimate, they seem to have this authority. And because they're running the experiment, you know, it's like, oh, okay, I better obey what they say. I'm, I'm in the experiment, right? Um, and then this idea of group pressure. So again, if, you know, you know that a lot of other people electrocuted this person, if you have multiple people trying to instruct you to do something, again, you're going to be more inclined to do that. Um, so in terms of the ethics, there are a lot of things that were breached, obviously psychological distress for causing, um, you know, that feeling of inflicting pain upon someone, again, withdrawal rights and beneficence um, and deception in this idea that they weren't um, told these sort of like objectives of the experiment. Um, okay, I think this is the last one we look at. So this is an experiment on conformity. So again, this is really all about um, social influence and almost like peer pressure a little bit. Um, so they basically got shown these four lines and these questions were very, very easy. And what they do, what they had to do, I think was like name like the, the line that wasn't the same height or like name, you know, something like that, like a very easy question. Like let's say for these four ones, they had to name again, for example, like um, which one was the tallest line or which one was the shortest line. So it's very easy to see, right? Um, so in the control group, they just, you know, they did whatever, they just had to answer the question. In the experimental group, all of the people gave the wrong answer. So they would go down the line and all of the people, so they're obviously not participants, they're all in on the experiment. They would say, okay, line one is the tallest line. Line one is the tallest. And they would go down and all of them would say line one is the tallest. Um, and then you can see that in that group, only a quarter of the participants always gave correct answers because the individuals would conform. You know, they didn't want to be seen as stupid even though it's very obvious which one was the tallest line which one is the shortest line you know the odd one out um if they said the correct answer they were the only person in the room to say the correct answer and it's this idea that there weren't any consequences you know it's not like a question about an opinion it's a very objective like is this line short is it long um yet they you know the majority of them gave the wrong answer because they didn't want to be perceived as perhaps silly by the other people in the room um so there's a lot of factors that you need to be aware of that influence conformity. So this idea of unanim unanimity, um, so the result being unanimous. So if you are the only one out of that group to say something different, you're much less likely to say it. If there's one other person who's thinking the same thing as you, then you'll be likely to say it and sort of like band with them. But this idea of it being unanimous, if everybody thinks the same thing and you're the only odd one out, you're much less likely to kind of go against the group. Group size as well. If three other people are saying this, you know, maybe you're a bit more likely as opposed to if 30 other people are saying line one is the longest. Um, again, you can see how the influence of 30 versus three would be a little bit stronger. Um, de-individuation is this idea of basically like slipping into the crowd. 
Um, so it's this idea of you not having like not a personality, but you're not having any, um, yeah, like obvious role. This idea that instead of being 10 individuals, you're one group. That's the idea of de-individuation. Um, and I think sometimes I feel like that con you kind of hear it. I don't know if this is random, but like you hear about that context in like concerts and stuff like that. When you're as, um, one group, you might act a little bit differently as to how you would be if you were by yourself. It's this idea of forming part of a group and sort of everybody losing their own, not individuality in the sense of like actual individuality, but this idea of losing their own sense of, um, like individual character almost, um, culture. So that idea of, again, um, if you're more likely to conform or not conform can be due to culture. So often like Western cultures might be a little bit less conformist than other, um, sort of Eastern cultures, um, social loafing. So again, this idea of kind of relying on other people and just going along with what other people say, and then informational and normative influences, this idea of agreeing with what other people say because you want to fit in or because you trust them. So some people might be like, I think so like normative is like, oh, okay, I'm going to say what they say because I want to fit in. I don't want to be, I don't want to fit it, like stick out. Um, whereas informational influence will be like, okay, I think the line is obviously longer, but I, I trust that these people must know something that I don't like that. I do like, I think I'm just stupid. Um, you know, they must be right. That's that idea there. So you can see how all of those would influence a person and make them a little bit more likely to not say an obviously correct answer. Okay, hopefully those three experiments made sense. Let me know if there's any questions on that. Um, with this idea of independence and anti-conformity, they're kind of like same, same, but different. So independence is this idea of being independent and having one's own ideas without being influenced by other people, basically. Um, so regardless of what you think other people want you to do or what the social norms are, you will act as to how you want to act. Anti-conformity is a little bit more beyond that in that it is directly sort of like opposite social norms. So you're being extremely, what everyone else is doing, you're not doing. So independence is, um, you know, if someone tells me to do this, I don't care. I'll do it if I want to do it, you know, even if it is the same thing. Um, whereas anti-conformity is if society wants me to do this, I'm going to do that. So it's that sort of idea of actively going against something where independence is, I'm just ignoring everything around me. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, okay. So we, you can kind of think about this in that context of that conformity experiment, um, but social groups and culture and this idea of, you know, peer pressure and what your, um, the people around you think of you is so um, influential in terms of your behavior. So this idea of social norms. So you're always wanting to act in accordance. Um, you know, we kind of inherently have this nature to fit in. We want to be accepted by other people. And so we sort of stick to social norms, um, you know, obviously like generally. Um, so that's the idea of, you know, you exhibit behaviors that you think other people would want to see you exhibit. You know, that's regarded as normal. That's regarded as typical. That's regarded as appropriate in certain contexts. Um, again, even if maybe it's not what you want to do or, you know, not what you should do, this sort of thing. And those social norms can obviously change between culture to culture as well. Um, and then pre oh my gosh, peer pressure. I'm sure you guys are very familiar with. Um, just this idea of being influenced by those around you, particularly, you know, friends of the same age, that sort of thing, um, in order to basically for them to make you do something that you probably wouldn't do if they didn't want you to do it. Hopefully that sort of makes sense. Um, and that's that idea that people will be, um, inclined to do something that they don't want to do in order to gain approval from other people. Okay. So I think this is maybe the last thing of this, but, um, in terms of influences of the media, I think this is sort of a new ish dot point. Um, but you are asked to consider the positives and negatives of having such a big influence of media, you know, at this point in time. So these are the four things that Vika specifically want you to be aware of. So social connections, this idea, again, positives and negatives. So the positives, 
of course you're socially connected you know you can um keep in contact with your friends with your family when it might be hard to without media um but then it's sort of this idea of the quality of the connections as well um in terms of you know how meaningful these sort of relationships are you know how well the media can actually build our relationships and maintain oh my gosh maintain our relationships so this idea of positive and negatives in that way um our social comparison so often you see you know they always talk about things like this particularly with like influencers and stuff like that this idea of comparing someone's sort of curated life which they've put on the internet to show other people and comparing that to you know your own like not terrible but you know your own life which you are very aware of and all the negatives of your life that you're aware of um whereas you know these people look very um perfect essentially so you compare their seemingly perfect lives to your own life um and that idea that that's obviously kind of a negative um addictive behaviors as well so again just the addictive nature of social media of sort of technology um and how the media can sort of perpetuate that and again that effect particularly on children is something that you want to be thinking of you know habits that are made in childhood and how that progresses on and again how that sort of can link to social connection so if you are sort of heavily influenced by media access as a young child how that affects um you know your relationships in the future both online and in person um and lastly this idea of information access so obviously it's a positive in terms of um you've got a lot of in oh my gosh you've got a lot of resources on the internet that you're capable of accessing you know a lot of helpful information that can be really beneficial and useful to you but also this idea that you have access to everything it can be harmful you know certain stuff that you're reading may have a negative impact on you um this idea of other people accessing information you know the concept of cyberbullying as well um all really important things to consider and how these all influence our behavior both again online and in person okay hopefully that all made some sense um so in terms of perception we the focus here is sort of on visual perception um with this new study design they've kind of brought in a bit on taste as well but like it's mainly still a lot of visual stuff but just be aware again when you're using practice questions from earlier years you might not see um as much stuff on oh my god sorry taste okay so learning about attention so this idea of what attention is the focused concentration towards certain stimuli at the expense of others so right now you know i'm focusing on my laptop and making the presentation and i'm sort of ignoring you know like my heater going on in the background i'm ignoring any noise from outside the room um that sort of thing and that's just what attention is when you focus on something you know your brain is always clocking everything that's going on in the room but you're not always thinking like, oh my gosh, you know, I can hear blah, 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 blah in the other room and I can see this and I can see that um, because you are, your brain is able to kind of hone in and focus on one thing. Um, so sustained attention is just that when it's sustained, when you're able to focus on one thing over a long period of time. Divided and selective attention are kind of your little opposite. So divided attention is when you are able to like multitask or kind of do two things at the same time. Um, so maybe if you are like talking and walking or like talking and driving, for example, so divided attention, you can see that sometimes it's a bit dodgy, um, as in like it, you can't really split your attention perfectly between two things, which is why you can't use your phone while you're driving. Um, but yeah, that's the idea of divided attention. When you've got multiple things in front of you that you are focusing on equally, um, Okay, and usually they're both sort of simple tasks as well. Um, selective attention. So selective attention is just when you're focused on one thing and you're ignoring everything else. Um, so like if you're doing a test, for example, if you're doing an exam, um, that's something where you'd be really putting quite a lot of attention and focus into one thing and ignoring other stimuli around you. Okay, so in terms of this perception, you know, whether it's visual, whether it's taste, whether it's any other form of perception, we have this sort of system from reception to interpretation. 
So reception is when your like your basically your sensory receptors just get this information in sort of its like raw form. Um, transduction is when this is sort of converted into a form of information that your body can kind of understand. Um, so if you receive information, let's say um, it's like maybe like touch on your finger or something like, or the way I'm touching my table right now, something like that. Um, the reception is this idea of the touch receptors in my finger sort of being activated and realizing, okay, I'm pushing against something here. And then that information gets transduced into something that the body can kind of understand. So perhaps it's sort of like neurons firing that idea. Um, and then it's transmitted. So this information is transmitted and sent to my brain. Selection is this idea of your brain, as I mentioned, gets a lot of sensory information. Um, it picks up on everything, but we don't pay attention to everything that, you know, our brain is sort of sensing or receiving. Otherwise our brains would literally explode. Um, so this idea of selection is paying attention to stimuli that is relevant. Um, so like, you know, right now, if my hands are up here, my elbows resting on my armrest or chair. Um, but you know, the whole time I'm giving this lecture, I'm not thinking like, oh my gosh, okay, my elbows are on the chair, my elbows are on the chair because of this idea that I'm paying attention to this, you know, what's kind of coming up on my screen. So it's that idea that you're paying attention to things that are important or relevant and other stuff that, you know, your brain is still receiving this information, but it's just not really that important. Um, and then you organize that and interpret it. So I'm looking at this diagram right now. I'm seeing reception, transduction, transmission. My brain is organizing this information and interpreting it so that I'm able to deliver a lecture on it. Um, that's that sort of idea. And again, this happens for touch. This happens for taste. This happens for vision, all of your sort of senses there. And then that's that idea of perception, how you perceive something and then how you can respond to it as well. Okay, so this idea of processing information. So you've got top down and bottom up processing. So your top down processing, this is when we're actually getting information and we're perceiving it. So I think, you know, you think about top down, it's coming sort of from the brain, whereas bottom up is like coming from your senses. It's that idea. So top down processing um, is that idea that you've got this information that's coming in and it's dependent on previous knowledge or experiences that you have. So maybe, okay, let me think if I'm processing something. So I'm going to the beach and I'm getting this visual information, maybe, and my brain is interpreting it and it's using my previous images of beaches, my notion of what a beach is in my head, you know, that stuff, like all my previous conceptions and experiences and expectations of what this beach should look like, what it would look like, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's that idea of top down processing. And then I'm perceiving this picture as a beach. And I'm perceiving, oh my gosh, this is the bluest beach I've ever seen. This is the most lovely beach I've ever seen. This is the ugliest beach I've ever seen. That sort of thing. Bottom up processing is literally just the information. So it's just, there is blue sea coming into my eyes, you know, or um, the weather is warm. That's it. It's not, oh, I love this warm weather, you know, actually perceiving this thing. It's just my, um, I don't know, temperature receptors on my skin are being activated. So that's why it's... Um, objective. So it's just literally just the information that's given to you. Whereas subjective is how you sort of interpret and perceive something. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Top down, just think about your brain is really involved. Bottom up is literally just, this is what is coming into my brain. Um, okay. So we think about the biological influences for vision and taste. This is specifically for your vision. Um, so your physiological makeup, so the actual sort of physiological structure of your eye, the aging, um, you know, how old you are affects how good your vision is. Obviously, you know, when you get older, your vision gets worse um, and your genetics. So again, this genetics and physiological makeup are kind of linked a little bit, but, um, you know, inherited factors such as um, color blindness or, you know, astigmatism or something like that, other things that affect the vision in your eye. You can see how all of these biological influences have a big impact on how you are to perceive something. The whole idea with this sort of chapter um, or area of study on perception is that people can get the exact same input, 
but perceived in different ways. So again, I can be looking at this beach. Someone who is younger than me will perceive it differently. Someone who's older than me will perceive it differently. Someone who's colorblind will perceive it differently. Someone who's got a different shaped eye will perceive it differently. Someone who's lived 30 years overseas will, you know, perceive it differently. It's all this idea about how our experiences and how our, you know, brains and physicality and everything like that influences how you perceive the world around you, basically. Um, okay, so in terms of this idea of interpreting and organizing information, so you've got your visual constancies and you've got your gestalt principles. And it's this idea about how things can look different, but you can interpret them and understand them as sort of like not being, yeah, being the same when we think about visual constancies, but then um, sort of being understandable in terms of your gestalt principles. So your visual constancies, when we think about size, it's this idea of things that are closer to you will look bigger and things that you, you know, push further away will be smaller, but you understand that they are the same size. Um, so for example, like this humongous giant cup that I'm holding, when it's closer to my face, I can understand, you know, it's a big cup. When I push it away, it looks smaller, right? But I know that this cup hasn't just shrunk in size as I've pushed it away. Um, it's this idea that, you know, I can tell like based on depth and stuff like that, that this is a constant. It doesn't change shape, sorry, change size. Um, shape is the same thing. This idea of from one angle, my laptop may look different. You know, from this angle, it may look different. I know that my laptop isn't shape shifting. It's this idea of I'm moving my eyeballs, basically. Um, and then same thing with brightness. So your brightness can sort of change. Um, so yeah, in the laptop probably isn't the best example because it emits light. But like if I'm reading, if I'm looking at a picture, a picture frame on the wall, you know, in the morning with full daylight, it'll be light. In the evening, it'll be a little bit darker. I know that this paper hasn't changed color. It's that it's simply just the brightness of the room has changed. So that's why we call them visual constancies. These will change, but you understand in actuality that the size or the shape or the brightness of something hasn't actually um, changed, even though visually it has. Okay, looking at just salt principles, we have a nice example of pictures here. Um, figure ground organization is basically this idea of separating things into what's in the sort of foreground and what's in the background. And that's how you're able to interpret information visually. Um, proximity is this idea of grouping things that are closer together. Similarity is grouping things that look close or look alike. Um, and closure is this idea of when things have gaps, you being able to mentally fill them in. So with figure ground organization, this is sort of a picture that we're thinking of. Um, so you can see that if you think of the blue as being sort of the figure and the white as the background, this looks like um, a cup or a chalice or something like that. Whereas if you think of the white as the figure and the blue as the background, it looks like two faces, you know, like two people kissing almost like facing each other. Um, so that's that idea of figure ground organization. Um, yeah, you can kind of think about it like maybe this as well, like it looks like a face, but it's that idea of what's in the um, foreground and what's in the background based on how you're interpreting it. Um, the other ones were proximity. So looking at um, kind of like this here, you can make out that it's a cube because I mean, no, this might almost, this could almost be closure as well. But this idea of proximity is that you group things that are similar um, Oh, sorry, not similar, like that are closer together. And then you can perceive a picture like that. Maybe like this as well, kind of like this idea that these are closer together and then you can perceive this sort of a smiley face. Um, that's the idea of proximity. In terms of similarity, so this is this sort of idea of similarity. You group things that are the same color together. So in this, rather than seeing six by six, you know, rather than seeing 36 dots just there, in my head, I see three blue lines and three white lines. That's the idea of grouping things. Um, proximity, yeah, maybe this, I don't know. Um, but yeah, 
proximity is just based on how close things are together. And then lastly, closure. So closure, yeah, I guess maybe like this one, this is probably a good example of closure. You can see that there are gaps, um, but you know that this is meant to form a tree. This is also this idea kind of um, of closure as well. Like there are gaps here, but you understand that we're forming sort of triangles, even though it's just like three quarter circles and random little lines here, you can sort of make out this picture of a triangle in the middle um, and kind of here as well. Um, there's no line depicting this circle, but you can kind of imagine that. So hopefully that makes sense. There are other really good examples, um, to have a look at, but it's just these principles that sort of allow us to perceive something. It just allows us to kind of make sense of things in our head. So when we see this, we can just see the chalice so we can see the two people. Or when we see this, we can just see, you know, um, three white lines and three blue lines. It's just that idea of our brain always wanting to kind of, um, group things, sorry, together. Okay, so perceptual set, this basically influences how you perceive things as well. Um, it's just how all of these factors come together to influence how you perceive something. So sure, we perceive something as information right in front of us, but our perceptual set also affects how we interpret that information. So our past experience, the context of, you know, where we're seeing this thing, the emotional state, so again, the sort of affect and your motivation. So this idea of um, your sort of, oh, it's kind of weird, but like your feelings to interpret something or, you know, you can kind of link it to emotional state, but this idea of um, a reason to interpret something almost. But you can see how all of these four things would really influence how you perceive something. And again, this is why two people can look at the same picture, um, but then they can see them in a different way um so maybe you know based on past experience i don't know sort of like with the figure out organization like stuff like this if you're more inclined to see the chalice or if you're more inclined to see the um faces it may be due to past experience it may be due to the context i don't know maybe you're thirsty or something like that um that sort of idea Okay, so we also have monocular depth cues and binocular depth cues. So monocular is you can pick up these cues using one eye. So with your monoc oh my gosh, monocular depth cues. Um, so with accommodation, accommodation is this idea of being able to um, see the picture and sort of figure out um, the depth of something based on what is in front of what. So this idea of um, accommodation, linear perspective, interposition, texture gradient, they all contribute to um, ultimately seeing depth. So in this picture, we see your, you know, three cars, all your things like that. Um, so if you think about your cars and what I was saying, kind of having things in front of each other, this idea of interposition, you can tell that this car is in front of this car um, because part of it is hidden behind the other. So you know that if some, like if this hand is in front of this hand, that's why you can't see part of this hand is what I'm trying to get at. Um, and you know that then like, it's kind of impossible for this green car to be in front of this blue car because of the fact that part of this car is hidden by this one. That's that idea of that, those monocular depth cues. Um, relative size as well, kind of what I was saying with the cup, if something's further, if something's smaller, um, like, you know, this car looks really small compared to this car. You know that these cars, if they were placed next to each, next to each other are probably the same size. Um, so it's that sort of idea of using relative size, height in the visual field, we'll get to in a little practice question. Um, but this idea about things that are closer to the horizon look a little bit smaller because if you think of something being closer to the horizon it's drawn a little bit um or you perceive it to be a little bit further away it's like often oh, i don't want to give away the question that we're going to do but um yeah it's that idea that if something is further from the horizon like this is technically further from the horizon um than this car so it's that sort of implication obviously based on size as well that it's a little bit closer to you because the horizon should be very far um, yeah, so that is that kind of idea there. Um, in terms of your binocular depth cues, you have 
Retinal disparity, which is basically when your two eyes don't match up and that sort of tells you where something is. So if you've tried, you know, you put like your finger here, if you close your left eye and then your right eye, you can see that they move slightly. Um, it's just your brain being able to pick up on that and figure out where something actually is based on the input of both eyes. Um, convergence is this idea of what we can see here when you when something's closer to you, your eyes have to turn, physically turn in a little bit more. And that's how your brain realizes what's close and what's not. Um, okay, so here is a question using some of the monocular depth cues that we discussed. So using only height in the visual field, describe how an artist would draw a second balloon of the same size to show that it is further away than the one in the picture above. Um, so thinking about that, we'll look at the answer on the next page. Trees need to be added to the picture. How could an artist use texture gradient to show that one tree is closer than another? So thinking about texture gradient, maybe going back into this um, picture that we looked at before. So with texture gradient, again, they're drawing trees. You can kind of think about it maybe with the grass. So this idea that things that are closer to you, you'll be able to see the texture more clearly than something that is further away. So, I mean, you can't really see it in this picture that well, but if you, yeah, if you're at the beach and you look down, you can see the sand and you can see individual grains of sand, right? Whereas if you look a little bit further in front of you, you, you can make out like, you know, it's all yellow, but you can't make out individual grains of sand because it's further away. So it's that idea of texture gradient, things that are closer to you, their texture is more visible. Whereas when they're further away, everything just sorts of, sort of blurs, um, into one. Um, okay, so here's the answer to that question. So um, the second balloon should be lower in the sky. So this idea of height in the visual field. Um, so um, show that it's further away than the one in the picture above. So this is the horizon. I don't know if this is meant to be like a mountain or something. Um, so to show that it is further away, you would draw it closer to the horizon. Okay, that's a lovely hair balloon, but hopefully that um, sort of makes sense because the horizon is further away. Um, okay, blah, 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 blah. Um, so you can say about them being drawn smaller as well, which we kind of talked about with like with this car and this car. It fits into this idea of relative size, but also height in the visual field because this is closer to the horizon, um, but it's obviously also smaller. Um, so you can mention that, but it said using only height in the visual field. So if you were to write something about how the thing should be smaller, um, you're not using the principle of height in the visual field there. So trees need to be added. How could an artist use texture gradient to show that one tree is closer than another? So the closer tree should be more detailed than the tree further away in the picture. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. And you can see the comments down the bottom. So this is from an old year 12 exam. Um, didn't say the year, but it's probably from like the early 2000s. Um, and so you can see that in the year 12 exams, the VCAR examiners give you sort of like feedback or some helpful points. So it can be really good to look at your, um, have a read of some older VCAR papers. And then you can have a look at what examiners are saying this is probably really important for three four so it's just a habit that you can start to build obviously in one two your saxon stuff are decided by your school um but yeah it's a good habit to sort of get into because in three four it's a very very helpful thing so the earlier you get onto it in three four the better um and they also tell you what percentage of students got it right and wrong so you can see that 80 percent got that right which is pretty good um okay so some sort of visual illusions um so this is the um, illusion of sort of when your arrowheads are facing different ways. So A and B, the line is the exact same size, but it looks like B is a lot longer and it's just based on the um, way the arrowheads are facing. So that's the idea of it being an illusion. So an illusion is, of course, like this sort of um, visual distortion, I suppose. So A and B are exactly the same size, but based on the arrowheads, they look... <laughs> it looks longer. Line B looks longer. Um, so it's just that idea about how the brain can be tricked into perceiving things. And I think it's just because one is open as opposed to one being closed. So for that reason, the brain is ultimately tricked. Um, so it's all about this idea of how other things can influence perception. Because like even I'm looking at it now, like A and B did not look the same size, but they are. 
Um, okay, so the Ames Room. I'm sure you guys will be familiar with this one if you've been to... Oh my gosh, I forget the name. That place in Phillip Island. Um, okay, but yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about. So the Ames Room is this idea of when you put your eye in, being aware this is a mon using monocular depth cues because you only have room for one eye. You don't have room for two. So that's why we can't really judge depth that well. Um, so the person on the left looks a lot shorter than the person on the right, even though, you know, they're probably the same size or one, you know, could be the opposite in real life. And it's because the room looks to be flat because you're using one eye, but it's actually, oh my gosh, shaped like a trapezium. So you can see that this, the, you know, again, you think it's flat, you think that it's equal, but this is actually coming forward. So this person is closer to you than that person. Um, and that idea that they're a little bit um, higher as well. So you can see that the room, the wall of the room actually goes like, it's wide and then it goes short. So this person looks like their head is touching the roof when in reality the roof is just coming lower and they're actually being brought closer to you. Um, so that's why they look so much larger than the other person. So it's that idea of a visual illusion. Um, okay, so this idea of agnosia, so this is a neurological disorder when you are basically unable to recognize familiar things. Um, so it's due to a brain injury and it's not due to an actual issue with your sensory organs. So, you know, you don't have an issue with your eyes or your ears or anything like that. So you're able to see things perfectly fine. Um, but in the context of visual agnosia, you basically just can't really, sorry, recognize familiar objects and sites, like even sometimes people, um, just due to that kind of brain damage there. Okay, so we looked at biological influences for vision. So for taste, it's kind of the same things. Um, so physiological makeup, there is something you need to be aware of. They are called super tasters. So the idea is that they have basically, they're born with a lot more taste buds than the average person. So their perception of taste is much more vivid. So they taste flavors a lot more strongly than a uh, like normal person with a normal amount of taste buds would. Hence the term super tasters. Um, so aging, so you lose taste buds as you age and sort of genetic factors as well. You may just um, be more sensitive to certain tastes than others. Again, perceptual set. Um, you can see that this is like very relevant with taste as well, because your environment really influences your taste. And so does your smell. Your smell obviously influences your taste a lot as well. Um, but the context, you know, your emotional state, are you mad, are you sad? You know, are you hungry? Have you eaten this food before? Um, that sort of thing. You can imagine how that influences the taste of something. Um, you need to be aware of this thing called miraculin. So if you guys have heard of miracle berries, so they make everything taste sweet. Um, so it's a little chemical basically and it binds to the like the front part of the tongue is what tastes sweet stuff so it binds to taste receptors there quite strongly um and it just basically acts upon them and sort of like activates them a little bit more so then when you eat something those receptors are like pinging like crazy and that's why everything tastes sweet because they're um those sweet receptors sort of towards the front of your tongue are uh, have just been really enhanced basically. Um, and so that's why, you know, there's little miracle berries so they can make yucky things taste sweet. Um, yeah, I'm sure you guys have heard of them before. Okay. And then synesthesia and spatial neglect. I think this is our last slide before the next block. Um, so synesthesia, again, you might've seen, um, people that have this like on the internet and stuff like that, but they essentially, um, perceive other sense perceive one sense with another sense so um it is this actual like kind of diagnosable thing and so they can often like taste words i feel like i you know sometimes i see videos when it's like um they'll say a name and then they can get like repulsed by the name because it tastes really bad um so it's that idea of or like when they see numbers they see colors as well um so it's that idea of a sense so you know such as like a word can be associated and be paired with um a taste or a sight stuff like that um a sound maybe as well spatial neglect is something different so this is often due to brain damage as well so you kind of can more commonly see it with a stroke 
um, often due to the rear parietal lobe. And remember, the, the parietal lobe is associated with your kind of proprioception and that sort of thing. And they basically ignore everything on the left side of their body. So their eyes are, aren't damaged. Like, they have vision of their left visual field, but their brain just can't interpret it. So when they're asked to draw, so they're, they're shown a picture of a clock. They're shown a picture of a clock and they draw it like this, like half, or they're shown a picture of a house and they draw only half of it because in their mind, they've drawn it completely. It's this idea of, again, very much in the name, spatial neglect. They just neglect this entire half side of their body um, or of their world, basically. Um, okay. Hopefully that all made sense. Again, I know that was a lot of information. Um, please let me know if there's any questions or anything like that. But we'll now go into the scientific skills. Um, so we'll have a look at this sort of stuff again. While you're in year one and two, basically these concepts apply across into units three and four as well. So the things that we're about to discuss they're identical to what you need to know in year three and four. So the earlier you can get on top of this, the better. Um, I feel like for a lot of three, four sciences, research methods and scientific skills, they're always seen as quite notoriously hard. And like, I agree, like I, I didn't like them when I was studying them. Um, and then that made me not want to answer questions on them. And I always found them hard. And like my sacks with research methods, I always did like a little bit worse in. Um, so I think it's this sort of idea that like, oh, it's really hard. It's really hard. But if you can just get across them in year 11 and sort of get on top of them and get used to answering questions on them, you'll do, it'll set you up really well in year 12 because everybody else who maybe hasn't done that, like hate scientific skills. Um, so then you're kind of already ahead of the pack in that sense. Um, and it's really, really important for exams. I always tell my students, um, people always tend to ignore the scientific skills. Like they look at, you know, behavior and perception and like obviously in year 12, they'll look at your year 12 knowledge um, and they'll know that like the back of their hand and their content and they'll think like, oh, okay, you know, I know what an independent variable is that I'll just slot in. Um, but then you really need to revise your scientific skills. You need to practice answering questions on them, you know, applying it to behavior, applying it to perception, applying it to your year 12 knowledge. Um, otherwise, you're just not going to know how to answer the question. So some people really neglect it and downplay it and think like, oh, it's just like, you know, I'll know how to answer it. Um, but you really, really have to practice it. It's a lot more terms than you might think. Um, and again, it's like the one thing in year one and two that stays exactly the same um, in three and four. So if you get on top of it this year, again, it'll be a lot better for you in the long run. Okay, so hypothesis C's are really important to be aware of. So here's an example of, an hi of a hypothesis. So Australian adults who read at least one book per week will score higher on a standard IQ test than Australian adults who don't read books at all. So it's this idea of mentioning your independent variable, which in this case is the amount of books that are read, your dependent variable, which is the score on an IQ test. You have to mention your population. So your Australian adults, this is an important thing. I feel like especially when you do other scientists, you're sorry, sciences, you're not really used to mentioning your, um, oh my gosh, you're not used to mentioning your population. Um, but remember that psych in this context of scientific skills, unlike the other sciences, it's all about people, you know, whereas for bio and chem, you're kind of working with like chemicals or plants or something like that in psych, you're working with people. So the emphasis is always on, you know, like ethics, and your participants and that sort of thing. Um, so you have to pay attention to the population. You shouldn't say I, it's meant to be objective. It's meant to be very scientific, you know, for general in your scientific skills and all of your things, you want to be writing very, um, not seriously, but like, yeah, you're not going to use first person. You're not going to, um, write colloquially. You're going to be writing a little bit more formally. Um, Okay, so you need to include these things that we've just discussed. So your independent variable is what you change. So that idea of the level of books that are being read or the number of books. The dependent variable is what's being measured. So that IQ test, scoring the IQ test, your population, which we've discussed. And operationalizing just means being specific. So not operationalizing this um, hypothesis would be like Australian adults who read more um, books will be smarter than Australian adults who read less. 
It's that idea that how much is more, how much is less, and what is our definition of smarter. Operationalizing is being very specific and outlining exactly how you're defining these variables. Um, okay, so we've got our experimental group and our control group. Remember that our experiment is basically the whole purpose of it is to figure out this relationship. So how does the IV affect the DV? That is the whole goal of everything that we're going to talk about um, in this section. So remember the importance of that. And then your experimental group and your control group, these are different to your controlled variables and things like that, that you mention often in like other sciences. Um, your experimental group are the people that will be exposed to the IV. The control group are people who are not exposed to the IV. So this is your baseline. So um, again, if you're trying to see the effect of like caffeine on memory or something like that, your experimental group might be, you know, five milligrams of caffeine, 10 milligrams of caffeine, 100 milligrams of caffeine, whatever, like all these different groups and different levels. And you're trying to see a trend, but you need to have a group that is not exposed to caffeine at all. It doesn't make sense for you to you know you're wanting to see the effect of caffeine and you start off with yeah five milligrams 10 milligrams 15 because you don't know what these people are like without caffeine you know they could be much smarter without caffeine like so you, let's say that their memory improves the more caffeine they take it's that idea that without zero caffeine so without this control group you're not going to be able to say oh, okay caffeine improves memory because who knows if maybe at zero caffeine they have the best memory out of all of these groups um, so that's why it's really, really important. Okay, so your three experimental designs. So you've got your independent groups when you are either in the control group or in the experimental group, you're not in both. This is the most common type that you'll come across in your Saxon in your exams. Um, it's like kind of pretty easy. It works well. The only thing is that it can lead to basically participant differences. So you've got, you know, a group of 20, you've got 10 people in one group, 10 in the other. It might just be that, you know, if you're doing ca effects of caffeine on memory, um, it might just be that this group coincidentally has people that have much better memories than the other group. So it's that idea of these individual participant differences or maybe people that have a higher caffeine tolerance or something like that. Um, and that's obviously something that will influence the results. And that's kind of a drawback of independent groups. Um, with matched participants, this kind of tries to control for that by pairing people up on a certain variable. So, for example, caffeine on memory, you might pair people up based on their um, memory or based on their yeah, IQ or something like that. Um, because then that means you don't really have that sort of unfair discrepancy between levels of education or intelligence or memory, that sort of thing. The other thing with this is it obviously takes a lot more time. Um, and also if you have one person drop out, ultimately you've got two people dropping out because that pair has to be gone now. Um, repeated measures. This is great for participant differences because you have none. You know, if I'm doing the test with caffeine and I'm doing the test without caffeine, my memory, you know, my innate IQ and my memory isn't changing. Um, so that's good. But the idea with this is that you are a little bit in trouble because of the idea of order effects. So order effects are what happens when people have to do the same task twice as part of the control group and the experimental group. And it can skew your results a little bit because people can practice ultimately. Um, so if we say that we're looking at the effects of caffeine on a driving test, and so they have to do a little driving simulation. So the first um, trial or the first thing tasks that they have to do they do it without caffeine right so they do their little driving they do it without caffeine and the next task they come back the next day and they do the exact same driving thing but now they're they're on caffeine right um the idea with this order effect is that they've basically had a chance to practice it so naturally they're probably going to score better the second time um not necessarily due to the caffeine but due to the fact that they are more comfortable with this task and the idea that they've had time to practice it the day before um so that's that idea of order effects so in order to eliminate that we use counterbalancing so instead of having everyone do the driving test without caffeine and then everyone the next day do the driving test with caffeine you basically split them in half so they do different orders so 
if you've got 20 people, it means 10 of your participants will come on the first day and do the test without caffeine. The other 10 will do the test with caffeine. Then the next day, you're going to swap around. So the 10, the, the, you know, the group of 10 will do it with caffeine. The other group of 10 will do it without. So that kind of gets rid of these order effects because um, they're both doing it. You've got people doing it. You know, some people are doing it with caffeine first. Some people doing it without. Some people doing it without caffeine first, then doing it with. Um, so it's that idea of sort of getting rid of that skewed result. Um, oops. Okay. So your extraneous and your confounding variables, really, 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 really important. If you've got an extraneous or confounding variable, your experiment is useless basically. Cause remember what I said before, the whole goal of this experiment is to figure out what the relationship is between the IV and the DV. If you've got a confounding variable, you basically can't say that, you know, caffeine has caused this change in memory because now you've got this other variable that can affect memory and you can't say it's definitely the caffeine that's done this because it could have been this other variable that you haven't controlled. Um, so extraneous and confounding are basically the same, but confounding is like, it's definitely caused an effect. Um, so it might be this idea of age and social socioeconomic status. Um, you know, we talked about like mem level of memory before, you know, maybe IQ, that sort of thing, um, depending on obviously what you're assessing. Um, so in terms of your placebo, so we talked about the experimental group and the control group. So if you're doing a drug trial and let's say it's for some kind of psychological disorder or something like that, um, the placebo or the idea of why you give a placebo is to reduce participant expectations. Um, so if you have an experimental group and you say like, you know, we're trialing this new pill for, um, like Parkinson's or something like that. Um, and then they take the pill, that idea of these participants know I'm taking something. So in their mind, it's like sort of psychosomatic. They expect to get better. That's why like sometimes, you know, like when you take a Panadol, like if you took a sugar pill, you'd probably still feel better. Cause it's this idea of like, oh, okay, I've got a headache, but I've taken something for the headache. So I'm expecting to feel better. And then your body can kind of trick you into like making you feel better. But anyway, that's something completely different. Um, but that's the idea. So if you have your experimental group, they are physically taking a pill. So in their head, they're going, okay, I'm taking something I'm meant to be getting better. Whereas the control group, let's say, you know, we're doing a, a drug test on Parkinson's. Um, you know, you don't know what group you're in, but go home. And over the next three weeks, they never put any pill in their mouth. They, they're kind of aware that they're in the control group and they're aware that they're not expecting to improve their symptoms basically. So that's where the placebo comes in. It comes in so that you can kind of get rid of that disparity. Um, so what it does is it means that both groups are now under this impression that they're taking something and they're both under this impression that, oh, okay, I should be feeling better. So it might bump up their scores a little bit more, right? Um, but it means that they're both on a level playing field. So you don't really care like, you know, maybe what the score is, but it's this idea of they both have the same expectations. You're telling both of them, like, you know, one of you is going to take a sugar pill. So then that can kind of help as well. So even in the experimental group, that thought in their mind, like, oh, okay, this, this could be a sugar pill. Um, that should hopefully kind of minimize that sort of psychosomatic effect of just feeling better after taking anything. Okay. Hopefully that also makes sense. So the experimenter effect um, is basically when the experimenter knows what group somebody is in um and then it leads to this sort of bias so if you are questioning someone and you know that they're in the experimental group you might sort of nudge them to get these answers or if you're doing data interpretation and you know it's from someone in the control group you might interpret it you know a little bit differently based on the results that you want to get um so to kind of control for that you just don't tell the experimenter what group the people are in Standardized instructions and procedures should be pretty straightforward. It's just, again, making sure everyone is on a level playing field so that nobody's treated differently um, so that you have no extraneous variables. Um, okay, so on this note of the experimenter effect, the way to control for that, the best option is to use a double blind. So single blind is when you don't tell the participants what group they're in. 
um, so, you know, yeah, let's say we're using a placebo, you're not going to tell your participants, okay, you're taking a sugar pill and you're taking this new Parkinson's drug, because again, that whole thing of participant expectations is going to come into that. Um, so you tell them like, Ooh, you know, like you don't know, is it a sugar pill? Is it a drug? And then everyone's on a level playing field. Um, a double blind is when you do that, but then you also, you know, so i.e. two parties are blind, you blind the participants and the experimenter. So then what we just talked about in the previous slide doesn't happen so that the experimenter doesn't know who's in the control group, who's in the experimental group, and that experimenter bias doesn't really come in. Um, okay, so random and stratified sampling. So sampling can all be a little bit different. Um, so random sampling is just when you select the people at random. And an important aspect of this is everybody in that population has to have an equal chance of being selected. So if you've got a really big population like Australia, um, every single person in this country needs to have an equal chance of being selected, which is obviously quite a hard thing to organize. But um, that's the idea of it being random. If you send out a newspaper, you know, that reaches every state in Australia, that's still not random sampling because, you know, some people might not be able to read. Some people might not be able to buy that. Um, some people might not go, you know, visit the shops where it's a bit like, you get what I'm trying to say. Um, so that would be convenience sampling. That wouldn't be random because not every single member of the population has an equal chance. Stratified sampling is when you, instead of um, everyone being random and having an equal chance, um, you make up the sample in the same ratio as how they are in the population. So if you've got more people that are under 20 years old and less people over 80, you're not going to have five under 20 year olds and five over 80 year olds in your sample. You might have 30 under 20 year olds and then five over 80 year olds, depending on the proportion of how they exist. You can kind of see with that example there. Um, okay. So your random stratified sampling. Um, so this is basically a combination of both, honestly, like random stratified and like stratified they're like kind of similar um but it's just this idea that within that subgroup they're all selected randomly um so again very similar to stratified sampling but just kind of combining both convenient sampling so this is a very common one if you do um oh my gosh i can't speak if you do experiments at your school you often like often you do them with little um like preppies and stuff like that i mean obviously depending on what school you go to but um, yeah, I remember when I was in year 10, when I did one, two psych, we always like uh, stole like the preppies and the year twos and stuff like that to do our experiments on, um, particularly like in unit one, when you look at development and all that sort of stuff. Um, but that is convenient sampling because obviously the population will be, you know, preppies or preppies in Victoria or preppies in Australia. Um, and, you know, choosing the class that's five minutes from you isn't very representative of the entire population of preppies in Australia. So that's that idea of convenient sampling. Um, it's a bad method of sampling. Um, again, obviously you do it all the time in a school, but in a proper psychological thing um, or experiment, you would not really want to use this because you can't generalize. I um, mean, we'll get to generalizations in a second. But yeah, it's not represent representative of the sample that you are Oh, sorry, the population that you're sampling from. Um, okay, so allocation is once you've gotten your, oops, sorry, once you've gotten your group, once you've gotten your sample, allocating them to your different groups. So for example, you've got independent groups. Um, the best thing, or like, yeah, the best thing to use for this is random allocation. They should always be allocated randomly um, and it'll try to minimize those sort of participant differences. Um, so the idea might be, you know, taking them out of a hat or like, I don't know, random name generator or something like that. Um, but you just want your independent, sorry, your experimental group and your control group to be comprised of a different mix of people. And the best way to do that is um, randomly. So again, it's this idea of you want to have a big sample size, so then you can afford to do that. So even if you've got, um, you know, yeah, like people of different socioeconomic statuses, people of different ethnicities, people of different ages, people of different whatnot. If you randomly allocate them and you have a big enough group, then both of those groups should be pretty like well mixed 
amongst those different variables. Um, okay, so in terms of maths, psych doesn't make you do much maths, which is pretty good. I Like on the next page, we have standard deviation as well. Honestly, like standard deviation didn't really come up a lot for me, but it is in the study design. So just know it. Um, but I think it's not a big thing that they emphasize. But qualitative data is essentially things to do with words, you know, your descriptors. Quantitative data is your numbers, your more objective sort of means of data. And you always kind of want to lean to quantitative data. Obviously, with psych, the nature of working with people, um, quantitative data is sometimes a little bit more hard to come by. You know, often you're using questionnaires, you're using self-reports, things like that. Um, qualitative data is still obviously useful, but it's just it is a lot more prone to bias and it can be a little bit harder to properly analyze. Um, in terms of the mean, um, it's just your average, basically. So you should just know how to calculate the mean. Again, you, I doubt you would get calculations. Your teachers might do it. Um, in terms of like actual Baker exams, they don't often. But I don't know if your teachers are mean, they might make you do means and standard deviations. But um, it's not too complex and they wouldn't give you a complex thing as well. I think from memory, you can't bring a calculator into the psych exam. So I don't think you should expect anything too crazy next year. And hopefully your teachers are on the, that kind of same page. Um, yeah. Okay. So the standard deviation, basically the idea is this line in the middle represents the mean. So that represents your average. Um, and whenever you're doing stuff with statistics, you always want your results to be close to the mean. Um, because that means that everybody's kind of getting the same sort of results. Like think about if you did that, um, test, you know, doing a drug trial for Parkinson's, um, and people were rating their, like how improved their symptoms were. If you have a large standard deviation, it means like some people are rating it, like, you know, their symptoms got worse by like negative 10, you know, maybe the mean was they improved by three points you know, other people were saying they improved by 30 points, like that sort of thing. Like, it's so white, like what have you kind of like done wrong to have people saying that their um, symptoms worsened and people saying that they improved by heaps, you know, but the average is saying that improved by a little bit. Um, it's kind of saying like, uh, you know, this probably isn't the best experiment. Um, whereas if you've got a small de standard deviation, it means everything's kind of tightly clustered around that mean. And it means that most people, you know, let's say the mean is that people improved by four points. It means most people got around that same ballpark, which is what you want. So you always want a small standard deviation um, as opposed to a big kind of spread. Okay, so reliability and validity. So reliability is basically just how consistent your method is. So if you're going to repeat this experiment, will you get the same results? Um, validity is this idea of, is your experiment designed well enough so that it is actually testing what it is set out to test? So, um, if you, so this experiment, again, the Parkinson's drug trial, um, is your experiment actually laid out well? Have you chosen the right participants? Is your method designed properly? You know, have you run it for long enough? Are you collecting data in the right way? Is this experiment designed to actually provide you know, results that you can use to say this drug helps Parkinson's, this drug doesn't help Parkinson's. It's the idea of how well your experiment is actually designed, um, you know, if it's valid. Does it actually test what it wants us to test? If you want to test, you know, how effective this drug is on Parkinson's, but you're like, you know, running it over a short period of time, you're not using like a good sample, um, you know, you're using like a bad method of data collection, you might say, oh my gosh, this is a miracle drug. It's amazing. It cures Parkinson's completely, but your experiment is designed quite poorly that these results aren't valid. This experiment has not measured what it is intending to measure. Um, so yeah, that's that sort of idea. Okay. So generaliz oh my gosh, generalizations are really important in psych. Um, it's this idea you often discuss them sort of towards the conclusion. It's about how, you know, these results that you've gotten from your experiment, can you apply them to the wider population? It's saying you've gotten these results in a sample. So in this sample, your drug has worked really well. If you gave this drug to 
everyone in this population, would you get the exact same results? That's this idea of a generalization. Um, so you can't do that if your sample is not representative of the population. So if you use convenient sampling, if your sample size is small, the representation of what you've got in this group, these people are not going to be the same as the rest of the population. So therefore you can't make a generalization. If you've got major extraneous variables, if you've got breached, um, breached major ethical guidelines, it's kind of that idea of validity. Like it's not really that valid. The relationship between the IV and the DV isn't really um, certain. So therefore you can't generalize. Um, if everything else is pretty good, like, you know, your experiment's pretty valid, you've used a nice representative sample, you can say, okay, I got these results in, you know, a thousand Victorians. And I think that they're pretty similar to the rest of Victoria. Okay, I'm going to, um, or a thousand really isn't that many, but like, you know, yeah, I'm going to say that I can generalize these results to the wider public. And therefore, you know, maybe I might go and sell this drug in the market now or something like that. Um, that's that idea. This is a really, really important slide. Um, note this stuff because you'll always get questions on improvements. And again, all of this stuff that I'm saying is what you expect to see again next year in Psych 3.4. Um, so if you've got a small sample size, obviously it's an easy way to rectify is just to make it bigger. Um, but you need to know stuff like, you know, convenient sampling to use a random sampling, your order effects to use your counterbalancing, um, experimenter effect, you know, to use your, your double blinds, basically. Um, it's really important to understand if you've got a problem, how you're going to fix it. VCAR will rarely ask you, like, you know, like what's a problem in this experiment without asking you what is the solution as well. Um, so that's really important to kind of figure out. Um, okay, so ethics are really important in psych. So you should be aware of, um, yeah, basically all of these. So protection of participants' information and confidentiality are pretty straightforward. Just these ideas of um, when you're going to participate in an experiment, you're not expecting your results to be published everywhere. Um, you know, you don't want random people to be contacting you, that sort of thing. So you have to keep their results confidential. You have to... Um, de-identify all the participants that you refer to and obviously keep everybody's information private. Voluntary participation is this idea of you shouldn't be coercing someone to participate. You shouldn't be, um, they shouldn't receive any negative consequences for not participating in the experiment. Um, withdrawal rights as well. You know, we've talked about that in terms of the other experiments where this was breached. If someone wants to leave, you have to let them leave. You can't trap them and keep them in this experiment even though it'll obviously probably be bad for the experiment and could like almost ruin your results. You, it's completely unethical to say like, oh, okay, no, you can't leave this experiment. Um, informed consent is really, really important. I'd probably say arguably the most important ethical principle. I think it, from my experience, it comes up in questions the most. Um, it's just this idea that again, as the name sounds, um, the participant is completely versed on what's going on in the experiment. They know about the risks. They know about what they're going to do. They know about why they're going to do things. Um, they know that they've got their withdrawal rights, that sort of stuff. Um, and they get that written consent. Um, obviously, if you're using deception, you wouldn't outline that in informed consent, but you have to do a really thorough debriefing. Um, and if you use deception, you have to get ethical permission as well, because if you use deception and it's really nasty um, and it causes a lot of harm to the person, that's obviously not um, going to be allowed. It's not worth the, the consequences don't outweigh the positives of your experiment ultimately. Um, so that's that sort of idea there. And yeah, debriefing again is just, even if you don't use deception, you have to debrief and you just give the results and all that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so hopefully that makes sense. Ethical principles are really, really important to be on top of. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. I think I've given a few exam tips throughout um, the lecture. My biggest thing would be um, don't stress too much with units one and two. Use it as a draft. Um, I think year 11 is a really, again, if most of you are in year 11 or if you're in year 10, um, it's a very fun time. Year 12 can be a little bit more stressful. It's obviously you have to take things a little bit more seriously in year 12. So I think just use 11 as year 11. Um, 
as a year to kind of figure out and almost like experiment with your exam taking style and your study style as well um, and figure out what works for you and what doesn't. I always say it's good to figure out what doesn't work for you in year 11 rather than year 12. You would rather try out this certain study technique for one of your sacks and like, you know, fail that sack or not do well in that sack and then know, okay, I'm never going to use this technique again um, rather than try that out in year 12 and then fail your year 12 sack. Um, so I think, yeah, that's my biggest kind of thing that I always say to students in doing units one and two, just always use it as a draft for units three, four, especially because psych is quite similar to psych one and two is quite similar to psych three and four, not necessarily like in terms of the actual content, but in terms of the structure, in terms of the question types, um, psych is a very application based subject. The questions are like, again, they're not really definition based, like bio or some of the other sciences. They're all, you know, Sarah is blah, 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 blah. Like, um, describe how, I don't know, her visual perception works or something like that, right? It's always you get this scenario and you apply your content to this person, to this specific example. So that's why practice questions are really, really helpful because it's important to be on top of the content, but you also need to know how to answer these questions. If you are super well-versed on the content, that's great. But if you get tripped up every time you have to apply it in an unfamiliar scenario, psych is going to be quite tricky, right? Um, use like, you know, your study groups, use your teachers, use other resources, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and again, find out what strategy works for you. If you like doing chapter summaries, if you like, you know, relying on videos, I don't know, psych podcasts, I don't know, whatever works for you, find the, find your learning style that works best and stick to that. Again, use it as a draft, but if you find something that works, stick to it. So then in year 12, you can stick to it and then get the same results. Um, that's what I'd suggest. And yeah, I would suggest to kind of get really familiar with the study design. When I was in units one and two, I literally didn't know what a study design was. And then psych was my first three, four in, oh my God, in year 11. Um, so I did year 11 in 2019. So I did psych one, two in 2018. Oh my gosh, it makes me sound old. Um, is that right? Yeah, Psych 1, 2 in 2018. Um, so I did my, yeah, Psych 3, 4 in 2019. That was my first 3, 4. And I basically only found out about the Psych Study Design like this time in 3, 4. Um, and I wish I knew about it earlier. And when I was in year 12 in 2020, then I did, um, I used my study design for all of my other subjects. It's really, really helpful. And I would suggest to you guys to actually do your chapter summaries with the study design in mind. I did my psych chapter summaries based on the chapters of the textbook, but psych textbooks can be filled with a lot of unnecessary and irrelevant information. It's a very wordy subject, right? Um, and I would get very confused and I would just write down everything that the textbook said, which was really silly. Um, so if you use the study design and refer to the study design dot points and do your chapters or your I don't know, dot point summaries based on that, I think that will help you a lot. And that kind of helped me in year 12 a little bit. Um, and particularly in three, four, it helps you keep quite focused in that, you know, what points are on the study design, you know, what's going to come up in your questions and you know, all that sort of thing. Um, so I think that can be really helpful. That's probably one of my tips, obviously take it or leave it. Um, so I think I've kind of mentioned most of this sort of stuff. Um, creating your own practice questions, flashcards, summaries, a lot of the areas of study in psych kind of cross over with one another. So try to draw connections because I'm sure your teachers will be inclined to sort of, especially in your exams, um, like combine behavior and perception sort of in one thing. Um, but yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Um, so exam questions. So again, I know, I feel like most schools you've probably kind of finished your an exam recently um most schools do like a year 11 exam mid-year and a year 11 exam so like unit one exam and a unit two exam some schools are really good and they'll do a unit one two exam like my school didn't but um i think it's helpful if they do a unit one two exam because that kind of gets you a bit more prepared for units three four but um yeah you're probably going to have a unit two exam i'm assuming most of you which will combine all of this sort of stuff um learn from the exams that you would have just completed 
Make sure you are always looking at command terms. Make sure you are noting the marking scheme, noting the lines even as well. Um, timing. Timing is really, really important. Um, note, you know, do you do your multiple choice first? Do you do your short answer second? Um, in year 12, in Psych 3-4, there's this big 10 marker. Some schools may do it in year 11, some may not. I think my school didn't. I don't know. I can't remember. It's too long ago. Um, but the 10 marker is very notorious and it is very hard. Um, but you just have to learn. Like once you learn how to do it, you can get through it. Um, but yeah, if you do have a 10 marker in your year 11 exams, really pay attention to the timing of that as well. Um, and again, noting the questions you get wrong, correcting an exam or a test is almost more important than doing it. Because if you just do the exam and you do them over and over, you're not actually figuring out what you know and what you don't. You might be identifying gaps in your knowledge, but you're not identifying how you're answering questions incorrectly. So really spend a lot of time reading your, rereading your answers and figuring out why did I get this question wrong? Was it a silly mistake? Did I interpret something wrong? Is my knowledge like actually incorrect? All this sort of stuff. Did I not have enough time? Just practice and figure out how can I improve from this is probably the biggest thing. Um, but yes, hopefully that sort of makes sense. And again, um, I know one, two can be a little bit hard. Some of the other states, their curriculum might match one to a little bit more. I would suggest you can, um, yeah, look through kind of Vika's old practice exams. And I mean like old, like, like 2002 and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, otherwise your teacher may, um, be able to provide you with a couple practice questions as well. And I'm sure you can kind of find some in other resources. So just be mindful of um, like even in your textbook, that's what I used a lot in kind of one, two, um, like the textbook questions that come at the end of a chapter, they can be helpful as well. But yeah, always just be doing a bit of practice just because psych is so full of application. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully I've answered all of your questions in the live chat. If not, again, feel free to email me. Um, it's just lordes at tutesmart.com. I'm sure it'll be written somewhere on the page. Um, but yeah, let me know if there is anything that I haven't covered or if there's anything you need to clarify that we haven't already. But otherwise, thank you so much for sticking around. I wish you guys the best of luck with Psych. You know, hopefully you guys continue with it next year. Um, if you're doing any three fours, good luck with that as well. I'm sure you guys will do really well. But otherwise, enjoy your break. Thanks, guys. Bye.